Welcome to Neurology Now's podcast about nerve entrapment with our special guest, Dr. Alan Belsberg. He's director of the Peripheral Nerve Center and associate professor of neurological surgery at Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore. I'm Stephanie Stevens. Dr. Belsberg, first, what exactly is nerve entrapment and what causes it? Uh, an entrapment, and we call it an entrapment neuropathy, is, the, is actually the correct term. But this is a peripheral nerve injury that occurs really at a specific location in the body rather than being a systemic problem occurring throughout the nervous system. And it's a mechanical constriction or mechanical entrapment of the nerve where the nerve is traveling through a tunnel or it's going where there's some sort of fibrous band in the body that's deforming the nerve. Uh, so it's most instances it's going to be direct compression of the nerve, either going through a tunnel that's too small or by some sort of band that's causing compression on the nerve or annulating the nerve. How common is it? Nerve entrapment's a very common problem. And if we, if we look at it in terms of how disabling is it, what does it do to our society or things like that, if we look at the labor uh, force and we talk about nerve entrapments, most people talk about back pain as being what really interferes with our labor force and so on. But peripheral nerve entrapment, specifically carpal tunnel syndrome, is probably as common as back problems for disabling Americans in the workplace. It's certainly the most common by far of the repetitive motion disorders. There are many types or syndromes of nerve entrapment, but in your experience, which are the most frequently reported? Carpal tunnel is certainly the most common of the peripheral nerve entrapments, but there are others that are fairly common as well. Ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow is very common, and it's something that most of us have experienced where you can perhaps lean on your elbow for a period of time and get some symptoms. And then a third area that would be fairly common as well is where one of the nerves crosses just below the knee joint. It crosses what's called the fibular head uh, on the outer aspect or lateral aspect of the leg, and that's also a little canal where the nerve goes through. So the perineal nerve, a branch of our sciatic nerve, would be entrapped there. Briefly, what are more traditional treatments and then please describe a couple of newer, more advanced treatments for nerve entrapment. In general, when we think about treatment, we like to divide it into non-operative care versus operative care. Uh, I stay away from the term conservative because in many instances, some of the things such as surgery may be more uh, conservative than non-surgery, depending on medication. So in general, let's talk non-operative versus operative. In the non-operative care, Probably the most common thing is stopping the repetitive motion that one is doing for bringing on the symptoms. Then there is splinting. So for carpal tunnel, the most common of the entrapments, splinting the wrist, especially at nighttime, is common. People tend to sleep with their wrist flexed or bent at the wrist and tucked under their chin. And that's a provocative maneuver, meaning that actually closes the canal even tighter. So we'll put a splint on the wrist to prevent that from happening. But we can also splint the elbow if that's where the problem is and so on. Changing the the posture, therefore, can can have a very positive effect. Medications are sometimes tried, and probably steroids would be the most common medication. Uh, People will try a steroid versus the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, such as aspirin or Motrin. These have had marginal uh, effects on, on most of the entrapments. Injections are common, so people will inject usually a steroid into the area that's inflamed to try to decrease some of the swelling. If the non-operative or traditional non-operative measures don't work, then we move into surgery. And surgery is basically designed to make the canal where the nerve is passing larger or to take away the band or fibrous bands that are entrapping the nerve. Traditionally, surgery has been open, meaning you make an incision and you look and see what you're doing and, and take care of the problem. And certainly, more recently, people have moved to minimally invasive or endoscopic approaches to the surgery, which in many instances, it's still unclear whether that truly offers an advantage, whether patients do better in the long term, but it's certainly something that's being looked at very carefully. Nerve entrapment can masquerade as something else, perhaps a spinal or back injury. What is your best advice to patients about how they can be their own advocate in this situation when they're complaining of symptoms and they don't know the cause? So a a nerve entrapment is a clinical diagnosis. 
And, and what that means is the physician or the caregiver who sees the patient is going to make the diagnosis based on the history and physical examination, based on the symptoms, which is what the patient tells you, and the signs, which is what you find on physical examination. And in most instances in medicine, and certainly in this instance with peripheral nerve entrapment, the, the symptoms, which is what you're telling the physician, is really the key. So it behooves the patient to be accurate in what they're telling the physician. That means you really need to pay attention to what it is that's bothering you, including when does it bother you, what tends to make it worse, what tends to make it better, what was the uh, preemptive uh, indication or what was the preemptive matter that may have brought it on. All of these things become very important for you to pay attention to and to be able to accurately convey to the health caregiver because they're going to use that more than anything else to help them make the correct diagnosis. They then go on and do a physical examination, and in the physical examination, again, you want to keep it as objective as possible and as accurate as possible. They may want to tap on certain areas to see if the nerve is irritated, and they're looking for the response, which is a tingling-type sensation, and it's very important that you're accurate telling the physician or the healthcare giver where that tingling is. So the history and physical become very, very important because it, in the end, it's a clinical diagnosis. You then go on to testing to help confirm the diagnosis. That testing may include electrical studies, such as an EMG nerve conduction study. It may involve imaging studies, like a uh, ultrasound, or in some cases, uh, MRI examination. And it may include some new approaches, which is called quantitative sensory testing, where very accurate sensory testing is done on the skin. All of these uh, become important because not only do they help the physician say that, yes, you have an entrapment syndrome, but of equal importance, they help you differentiate it from other problems. So in doing the testing, something else may come up where the physician says, you know, it looks like, in fact, you may have an entrapment syndrome, but you also may have something else. Or more importantly, although this sounds like it's an entrapment syndrome, in fact, this is now looking more like a pinched nerve in your spine that's mimicking uh, an entrapment syndrome, but this is more likely coming from your spine with a pinched nerve, a uh, pinched nerve also known as in the leg sciatica. That would be the most common one. By the same token, if you had presented with typical sciatica or a typical uh, problem in the upper extremity with radiating pain, these testing may have told the physician, in fact, it's not coming from your spine. This looks more like a peripheral nerve entrapment. So the, the ancillary testing, the additional testing, becomes very important. And finally, that testing will sometimes turn up a problem that's in the body that's predisposing you to a nerve entrapment. So if there's an underlying neuropathy, such as diabetes can cause underlying neuropathy, that can predispose you to an entrapment syndrome becoming symptomatic, whereas prior to the actual development of the underlying problem, it may have gone unnoticed or, un or, or not be symptomatic. Thank you, Dr. Belsberg, and thank you for joining us here on Neurology Now. I'm Stephanie Stevens.